It would be incredibly convenient if there were a book from, say, 1490 that gave every tribal name and all their ceremonies. Even this map is woefully inadequate. Unsurprisingly, much more idiomatic cultural elements, like ideas regarding sexuality among the various tribes of the Americas, are practically impossible to diagram accurately. Some tribes simply had no method for recording their histories other than oral tradition. Other groups, though they had written languages, may be indecipherable. Still others may have documents, but those documents contain in-culture references that don't make any sense to someone who didn't live among them. What most European-based historians and anthropologists are left with are interpreting the few surviving stories and the records of foreign explorers who had their own agendas and interests in what they chose to record. It is this record of insults, violence, and settlement which I will be discussing. If you are able, please join me. If you are not able, I entirely understand. Some called them putos, some called them Amazons, a few even called them hermaphrodites. At one point, they just stole a phrase from Western Asia and rebranded it as their own because there were too many versions of us to keep clear in their tiny little binary brains. But no matter what term they used, no matter how fragmented and manipulative their histories, we are throughout the Americas and from the earliest European contact. This Thanksgiving, those stories fill me with gratitude. Please allow me to show you why. Vasco Núñez de Balboa was a conquistador who decided, in the early 1500s, he wanted to make a name for himself in the Caribbean. Around 1513, he decided present-day Panama was his for the taking. But he encountered resistance. This was only two years after the drowning of Diego Salcido by the Tainos in present-day Puerto Rico, which helped to spark the Taino Rebellion of 1511. He knew he had a challenge ahead of him. Part of Balboa's terror campaign was recorded by the Italian historian Peter Martyr Dianghieri in his text Decades, pieces of which were then made into etchings of specific events by artist Theodore de Bry in 1594 in what he called his Grand Voyages series. Balboa liked to use Spanish bulldogs as part of his intimidation tactic. They were trained to attack on command and walk along beside mounted soldiers. No hate on any bulldog owners. These were trained war dogs, not family pets. In order to undermine indigenous identity to impose Christian ideas of sin to maintain the process of erasure, he chose a target of respect and debased it. He took people of honor and dishonored them. He replaced love with cruelty, lies, and subjugation. He did it when he fed a group of four dozen putos to his dogs, an act dutifully immortalized by de Vrij, some of the very first pictured victims of European invasion. Eventually, Europeans would settle on a new insult, berdache. It's a French and Spanish term, mangled from Persian, and originally a reference to a receptive male prostitute. The term was perfunctory, collectively summarizing anyone who did not behave or dress in a way that European explorers found appropriate. Handily, it wasn't just an insult. It was also a method for flattening all of the vast and amazing peoples and traditions they were observing. A sweeping act of erasure, certainly, but also proof that so many of us existed, they needed a word for us. What the Spanish had found in the Caribbean, the French described among various Illinois tribal groups, including the Miami, the Dakota, and the Fox. As early as 1704, Pierre Delette, who traveled with the La Salle expeditions in the 1600s, wrote what has become one of the most important accounts of 17th century Illinois tribal life. Antoine Denis Radeau, who served from 1705 to 1710 as an intendant of what was New France, used Delette's records to report on the habits of the natives, as quoted in the Berdachi and the Illinois Indian tribes during the last half of the 17th century by Raymond Hauser. Young boys were seen frequently picking up the spade, the spindle, the axe, but making no use of the bow and arrows as other small boys do. They wore a skirt made of a piece of leather or cloth, which enveloped them from the belt to the knees as women do, covered the upper torso with a little skin like a shoulder strap passing under the arm on one side and tied over the shoulder on the other. They were tattooed on their cheeks like the women, and also on the breast and on the arms. They speak in the accents reserved for females. Though Delette is almost clinical in his initial description, he does not hesitate to express his feelings about the appropriateness of overall Berdache behavior. The sin of sodomy prevails more among these people than any other nation. 
which is quite a declaration to make, considering how few of the total native population of the Americas he'd met up to that point. More than anything, his notes make it clear how Europeans regarded differences of sex and sexuality among the peoples they encountered. A contemporary of Delette, Father Jacques Marquette, goes further and states, They pass for manitous, that is to say, spirits hinting they were not only integral parts of their native community, but served a spiritual role. That Delette and Marquette are unreliable narrators doesn't discount the basic proof that they were treated, at least as equals, by their own. English speakers were aware of these traditions as well. One such chronicler who used it repeatedly was George Catlin. He traveled along the Mississippi River Valley in the 1830s, and during his travels, he also sent regular correspondence to his friends back in Washington, D.C. about what he was seeing. Letter 56 is quite the wellspring of information because he fancied himself an amateur painter, so he included with the letters illustrations of the groups he visited and the ceremonies he witnessed. He's used as a primary source to this day. One such illustration was what he titled Dance to the Burdashi, which he recorded while visiting the Sack and the Fox. His description of the dance is extremely informative if one reads between the lines. A funny and amusing scene which happens once a year or oftener, as they choose, when a feast is given to the Berdashi, as he's called in French, or Ikukua in their own language, who's a man dressed in women's clothing, as he is known to be all his life, and for extraordinary privileges which he is known to possess, he is driven to the most servile and degrading duties, which he's not allowed to escape and he being the only one of the tribe submitting to the disgraceful degradation is looked upon as medicine and sacred, and a feast is given to him annually, and initiatory to it a dance by those few young men of the tribe who can, as in my sketch, dance forward and publicly make their boast without the denial of the Berdachi. He then gives the chant they sing to the host of ceremonies, but unlike all the other ceremonies he records, he doesn't translate. It's left in dialect so as to further alienate the reader. He ends by saying, Such and such only are allowed to enter the dance and partake of the feast, and as there are but a precious few in the tribe who have legitimately gained this singular privilege, or willing to make a public confession of it, it will be seen that the society consists of quite a limited number of odd fellows. This is one of the most unaccountable and disgusting customs that I have ever met in the Indian country, and so far as I've been able to learn, belongs only to the Sioux and the Saxon foxes. Perhaps it's practiced by other tribes, but I did not meet it, and for further account of it, I am constrained to refer the reader to the country where it is practiced, and where I should wish that it might be extinguished before it be more fully recorded. His sentences run on, but the meaning is clear. It's worth noting that Catlin refers to several dances in the same letter. The begging dance, the discovery dance, the dance to the medicine of the brave. All are kindly described as a combination of pantomime and ceremony, as well as a method for reinforcing social cohesion and togetherness. Strange, then, Catlin would single out the Berdashi's dance as something sarcastic, almost mocking, especially given the Berdashi is apparently having a feast in his honor, with several strong young men dancing for him, from which he's expected to choose his favorites. After all, if you've never heard of it before, then how'd you know the word for them, George? It is in the last sentence Catelyn reveals why, at the same time, the Berdashi is loathsome and yet holds so much power. The Berdashi is loathsome to Catelyn. It's clear from the way the Lakota, the Dakota, the Sax, the Fox, they are treating this member of their community with respect. It's clear that Catelyn doesn't. This was also far from the only time the federal government was made aware of a so-called Berdashi. John Trumbull surreptitiously sketched five Creek dignitaries visiting the, at the time, capital of New York in 1790 as they arrived to negotiate a treaty with the government. For all five of the dignitaries, he gives their name. For three, he gives their various titles. But for only one does he list their gender, Hisak, or the woman's man. Funny he felt the need to be so specific for just one person. Maybe he thought Hisok was so pretty they needed further clarification. And it was 30 years before Catlin claimed he was hearing about those people for the first time. 40 years after Catlin, the U.S. government got a third chance to find out about us for the first time. The Zuni are one of the tribes in what is now New Mexico. Weehua was one such Zuni. They were known to dress in both men's and women's clothing according to what suited them at the time. They served as a contact point, educator, and mediator. And in 1886, they traveled with a delegation to a conference in Washington, D.C., which culminated in meeting President Grover Cleveland. 
Much has been written, both at the time and in retrospect, on this section of the history of the Americas. It was a time of violence, as well as a time of treaties, expansion and elimination, propaganda and racism. What is undeniably true is by the time most of the major wars were over and Europe was here to stay, Portugal got Brazil, Spain got most of Central America and sections of South America, England got the colonies that would become the United States and Canada, and France got a strip from Quebec to Louisiana, which they later sold to the British and US respectively, and the native population got whatever all the others decided. The cohesion of tribal groups continued to fracture, and some information became lost in the process, Following the colonization, transportation, reservations, and boarding schools, maintenance of tribal traditions meant minority concerns within the tribes were sacrificed for the sake of survival. Sexually distinct practices and interpretations were harder and harder to preserve. Eventually, ideas of gender not readily translatable into the new American culture were hidden, forgotten, or actively destroyed. In many ways, the history of the modern movement involved a rediscovery of pre-Western expansion records from the very cultures that had done the damage in the first place. This revival and revitalization effort is complex and becomes quickly interwoven with identity, politics, disease, and appropriation. One of the first organizations in this revitalization was the Gay American Indians, founded in July 1975 in San Francisco by Barbara Cameron and Randy Burns. Barbara had been raised on a Sioux reservation in South Dakota. Randy, a northern Paiute and a member of the Pyramid Lake Indian tribe, had moved to California from Nevada. By the 1980s, their business office was in the Pride Center at 890 Hayes Street, where they held community gatherings and dances and shepherded the Gay American Indian History Project. Barbara has since passed away, but the organization remained active for several years. Randy has remained active in the movement, writing editorials, serving on advisory committees, and producing a film of Paiute elders speaking on tribal tradition. The Gay History History Project has also contributed much to historical awareness and identity. One former coordinator, Will Roscoe, is the author of several books on documentation and practice from various tribes. The most recent shift in how many of these topics are discussed was in 1990, when at an international conference over a dozen regional societies decided to once and for all confront the centuries-old insult, replacing Birdace with the term Two-Spirit. Its meaning is difficult to summarize and most natives don't tend to use it except when speaking to audiences outside their communities. It suffices to say the term is meant to separate the overt sexuality of words like homosexual or berdache and instead focus on cultural differences and unique gender systems. In fact, several natives like Cherokee elder and professor Benny Smith use the same term to refer to walking between two cultures, such as being both black and Cherokee. As the influence of the Two-Spirit movement grew, retranslations of ancient texts revealed spirits, guides, guardians, and beings every bit as gender-creative and loving as any back in ancient Europe. Loki and Hermes ain't got nothing on the Toltec spirit that the Aztecs referred to as Xuchpili, the flower-crowned prince, who with his sister consort competed for how many men they could seduce and celebrate whose domain was gay men and hallucinogenic plants that opened the mind to a higher consciousness and allowed his followers to speak with the ancestors and thereby better understand their place in the universe, or the mischievous storytelling rabbit, who some called Shuchpili's brother, who taught the people to make a corn drink that, shall we say, lowered inhibitions. Even those from other lands, who came to be here through no fault of their own, found comfort and camaraderie in these shared stories and images. Inle and his lover brother sister Abata, the dandy Baron Samdi. No truth is identical, but the themes are unmistakable. East Coast tribes, West Coast tribes, Mississippi tribes, Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean, Central American, North and South. Everywhere Europe went, Europe found us steadfastly refusing to act the way they were so sure we should, refusing the genders and sexualities they demanded. I'm not giving these examples because I want to somehow validate the right of European settlers and so-called naturalists to speak to indigenous traditions. It's to clarify these traditions have been well documented by earliest contact, an unbroken line of rejecting those narratives, steadfast refusal to conform to expectation, and how much time and energy they invested in vilifying us. From the very first moment Columbus set eyes on the Bahamas, even while recording our truths they tried to erase us. I will never know the countless names, I will never hear their last words, but I can see their beautiful and terrible faces immortalized as anything but ignored. We scared them with our defiance. And so it is. I celebrate those nameless ancestors five centuries ago, those forty sodomites, 
Such a defiant threat to European conquest they gave their lives being fed to dogs. I celebrate that nameless Berdachi, the Ikukua Catlin insulted while still being captivated. I honor Hisak and Wiwa and the power the names carried through time. This indigenous heritage month, this month of trans remembrance, this month of thanksgiving, I do indeed remember our heritage and give thanks. I celebrate how the erasure failed, and I quote in reply the last recorded words of Taino Chief Hatui, burned at the stake for heresy. Offered one last opportunity to repent, he replied, if Spaniards go to heaven, I choose hell and my people as far from you monsters as possible. So to all my fellow two-spirit healers and water protectors, magnificent Mahu, proud queers, elegant Musi, loving tribal aces, beautiful black and brown, pans, trans and non-binaries, keepers of the histories, tellers of the stories, to the many voices of culture and rebellion and pride rippling through the ages, from then to now, through all the pain and strife and power and ceremony, colorful, crazy, captivating, and unsilent. I give thanks. For those of you who are interested in learning more about the Two-Spirit Movement and history, I've included several videos linked in the down below. This includes a talk by James Makokis, who some may remember as an indigenous competitor on The Amazing Race Canada, but who is more importantly a Two-Spirit Cree Canadian physician who operates a trans-affirming health clinic in Alberta. I've also included links to videos by natives about Two-Spirit identity and some organizations throughout the U.S. which may be useful. If Two Spirits are unfamiliar to you, please watch the videos first. I've been very careful in which links I provided. Many of these are my friends and honored elders. I ask you see the various organizations as a place for connection and understanding, not simply a resource for satisfying a temporary curiosity. If you've enjoyed what you've seen of my work, please feel free to like and subscribe. I have a Patreon if you're so inclined. And uh, to that end, I would like to give a brief shout out to my newest Patreons. Nick C, Elizabeth All, Marion West, Raphael Hill, Athena Rogers, Aaron, Chaotic Capybara, and Ted Prodromu, and a continued place of honor for Du Kea Han. Above all, I hope that this message finds you well. I hope that you are in a safe and supportive place, and I hope you have fun.